So, and which is the thing of the seminar? Eh? This seminar uh, <coughs> is part of an investigation still in progress, which concerns, I could say, <coughs> the archaeology of commandment. So, the commandment is the thing for us. The archaeology of commandment. Uh, this will imply also an archaeology of the will. So, also this concept is. Uh, there. But let's so first make some commentaries on the title of the seminar. I said archaeology of commandment. Let's uh, leave apart the term archaeology, we'll come back to that. And let's make some commentary on this notion of commandment. As you will see, the first thing I discovered when I, had, when I decided to investigate on the commandment is that um, there is almost nothing in philosophical tradition about this subject. You can have here and there a phrase, two, twenty lines, on the commandment, but no real reflection on that. That's really strange. There are, of course, uh, when the subject of power uh, is taken in account, then uh, there are many people who have reflected not on <coughs> commandment, but on obedience. Why do men obey? I refer, for instance, to the beautiful and very famous booklet by Etienne Laboiti of 1552, uh, uh, Discours sur la servitude volontaire, Discours on the voluntary servitude. And this is a book, a reflection on obedience, it's a reflection on tyranny, it's a book against tyranny, and tyranny there is explained with the stubborn will to serve. People have a stubborn will to obey, to serve, to be enslaved, to let them to let themselves enslaved. So it's a beautiful reflection that uh, he analyzes uh, this uh, will to serve, will to obey, uh, in, in all its forms. And then he, he very uh, <coughs> acutely says that uh, we, do, we must not think that power is grounded on weapons, swords, spears, guns. It's not at all. Eh? It's uh, grounded on obedience, on the will to serve, to obey. Eh? People will obey. So there are very interesting reflection on uh, why do people obey, what is obedience, what is to serve, what does it uh, to, serve, to serve me, but n almost no reflection on the counterpart, <coughs> the commandment. So he, tr he tries to explain obedience as if commandment did not exist, which is really strange. And I think that this is not enough because also if you try to understand the relationship between power and uh, commandment, power and obedience, uh, you will uh, see that the power does not <coughs> collapse when, simply when it's no more obeyed. Power tolerates, in, in the history you, will see, you can see uh, that uh, power can tolerate many degree of obedience, disobedience, transgression. There are many forms of power. Someone or someone of them will uh, uh, accept a certain degree of uh, disobedience. But the power does not collapse when it's no more obeyed, as we used to think. There is a, a beautiful book by a great Austrian writer of uh, the 20th century, Alexander Lernet Olenia, which is called uh, the translate the flag, perhaps, 
So it's a book on the collapsing of uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of the First World War. <coughs> do, do you hear me clearly? Yes. yes. Would you repeat the name of this author? Lernet hyphen Holenia with each. Great, great writer. So, so uh, there is a moment in this book when uh, we see so the, the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is collapsing, so each uh, at the, uh, each nationality tries to separate. So we at the moment there is a, a regiment made by Hungari Hungarian troops which simply refuses to go on, refuses to obey. So the, the commander, the, the general says, you must uh, fight and say, no, we stop here. Then you see that the, the officer is really, does not know what, what to do. And, but then he, he still made, gives order. And so in a, in a certain moment he finds another regiment, this time made by Austrian troops. And this regiment will obey, comes and fires on the other regiment, so the other regiment has to obey. So uh, if there is still someone who gives command, even if it's no more obeyed, little obey, still power is there. Power really collapses where no one can give orders anymore. This was also evident, I think, at the moment of the fall of the Berlin, Berlin Wall. What you had there, people began to disobey. That's clear. But, so there were degrees of disobedience. Some, uh, some soldiers, some policemen still, in, in there are points in which some policemen still uh, obey to the order. But then, really, the, the Democratic Republic collapsed when no one gave orders. So, so that, that's why I think that it's important to try to understand, instead of asking the question, why do people obey, also to ask the question, why do people command? And what is a command? <coughs> and we see it's not at all an easy question. So, this is for the term commandment. Uh, Let's now go back on the term archaeology. Uh, of course, I take this term in the sense of Michel Foucault. <coughs> He's an archaeologist, the quest for an arche. And uh, why I think uh, it's, this is so important to, when faced with the problem, first of, of, of all, to, uh, to try to do an archaeology of this term. Very simply because I, I think that the only way to accede, to have access to the present, is an archaeological gesture. There is no immediate uh, uh, access to present, contrary to what the journalists believe. So if you are a journalist, you will think that you have uh, an immediate uh, entrance to present. On the contrary, present needs an archaeology. And the only way to accede to present, I think, is to go back in the past. We go, we go back to this uh, problem. But then, so when I decide to begin an archaeology, commandment, suddenly I was confronted with a, an unexpected problem. Archaeology is the mean, is the quest, eh, the investigation, the quest for an arche. Arche means in Greek beginning, origin, but then arche also means in Greek commandment. So the term arche has in Greek two meanings equal: commandment and origin. Uh, 
that's a very strange fact. No? I don't know if you reflected to this uh, very common thing. If you open a dictionary, you will find that very often, commonly, the term has a plurality of meaning, which some, uh, sometimes seems to have nothing to do the one with the other. That's, uh, we accept <coughs> it as normal, and in our dictionary you will have one, two, three, four, they will list all the meaning of the term as if this was normal. Then you will have, uh, for instance, if you have an etymological dictionary, then you have the work of the etymologist who will try to uh, uh, give, them, give this plurality back to an original unity, the etymon. But I think that uh, this uh, fact is the polysemy eh, of our language, languages is in some way uh, uh, coessential to language. Eh? A term can mean, and we can think in language, only because terms have many meanings. And this is a part of the strategy of philosophy. Eh? For instance, uh, the the gesture of Aristotle. When Aristotle confronts a problem, the first remark he will make, for instance, for the problem of being, he will say, to on legetai polakos, the term being is said in many ways. And he will say the same for life, and the same he will say the same for arche. He does say that. Arche legatei polakos has many meanings and it is thanks to this plurality of meanings, to this polysemy then a strategy of thinking can be set up so um, this is a general remark uh, this, this idea that uh, the polysemy is essential to the philosophical approach to As for the term arche, eh, the polysemy in a way uh, seems understandable. Eh? From the idea of beginning and origin, you can have the idea of commandment. From the idea of being the first, you can have the idea of being the chief. So it's not so strange that, uh, apparently, it's not so strange that uh, origin and commandment are the same. And this, this is a, in Greek a, not only arche, for instance, the term arco, and the verb, means to begin and to command. And the archon, if you are familiar with the history of Greece, the archon, literally the one who begins, is the name of the highest authority of the police, the city, eh? the archon. So it's a magistrate. So the, this polysemy is everywhere as far as the, uh, the family of Arche, Arco, etc. is a uh, question. And then uh, this is also not only in the uh, Greek tradition. For, the, for instance, uh, you are familiar, of course, with the fact that uh, if you take the Greek translation of the Bible, the so-called Septuagint, uh, made by the rab rabbis in Alexandria in the second century before Christ. Uh, the, the Bible begins en arche, uh, in the beginning, in the origin, God created heaven and earth. <coughs> but then you will see that how did God create heaven and earth? through a commandment, geneteto, let it be, let be, eh? imperative. And the same is for John's Gospel, eh? which begins, en arche en o logos, in the beginning was the word, the logos. Uh, you could legit very legitimately translate this phrase, in the commandment was the logos. 
meaning that the term was in the place of the commandment. And by the way, a word which is in the origin can only have the form of a commandment. If there is nothing else, if nothing exists but language, you can only have a commandment, an imperative. So, let's now establish this very important fact that in our culture, the arche, the origin, is always already a commandment. The beginning is also the principle which commands and rules. That's a very important uh, fact. Ah, by the way, there is a, perhaps a kind of a ironic uh, awareness of this uh, secret link of uh, beginning and foundation, beginning and foundation and commanding, etc. In another curious poly polysemy of the, of the Greek term, uh, the Greek term arkos means in Greek the chief and very strangely the anus. I think this is the spirit of language who makes a pun. Eh? The foundation, the commandment, the power is also the ends. So, so it's a pan of this uh, curious solidarity in our culture between foundation and commandment, foundation, chief, foundation, or origin. But then we have to understand, uh, to better understand this solidarity and this connection. So there is this uh, polis polysemy, so the, the same term means both. But then this means also another important thing, namely that the beginning, the arcane, is what commands not only the origin, the starting point, but also the development, the growing, the circulation, the transmission, in one word, the history of what of that of which it is the origin. Whatever this may be, an idea, a being, a knowledge, a praxis. So the, the important point is in our culture, the origin is not merely a start, a starting point which after disappears in what it has initiated. No, on the contrary, the origin never ceases beginning. That is to say, never ceases to rule and to command and to govern what it has created. That's a very important point. So the, the link of origin and commandment means also that the origin will also command the whole history of what it has originated. Is this point clear? This is the, the, the peculiar effect of our culture. So, and the, the, as I said, the, the, the solidarity of origin and commandment is understandable. But then, what does this mean? That, that this means that uh, the origin will continue to command, never ceases beginning. Yes? Could you give an example? Yeah, I made a very. Uh, simple example, for instance, so in uh, Christian theology, God creates the world, eh? so he gives origin to the world, but then uh, immediately the theologians will uh, state that the creation is a creatio continua, a continuous creation, because God does not create and then disappears. God will continue to govern the, what it has created. We have the notion of providence, etc. But this means that the creation never ceases. Creatio continua. And this is a, a strong point in the Christian theology. Creatio is not an event which ends, disappears. It is con never ceases to create. And the, this continuity is the commandment of uh, the history of what it has created. But 
tenement, this means that uh, also if you, whatever act of creation, of origin, of giving origin you take in account, in some way you can uh, uh, see this fact that the origin does not disappear. It's not, it's not an event, a neutral event, which has nothing to do with the growing being and the history. There is a, always a link. And, and this is why uh, Arche means both. So in some ways you can say that the uh, origin is never sublated. It's never? It's never sublated in an alien sense. Yeah. Ne ne it's never abolished, never disappeared, never ceases, but continues, it's continuously there. And in which form? For instance, the idea of a continuous creation, but also in the idea that this uh, origin will rule and command and determine the history, the life of what it has created. Any other? So we can est establish so this first point that what we can call the archaeological historical machine of Western culture grounded on this solidarity of uh, origin and commandment eh? it's some is a machine which will which will function binding together binding together origin and commandment so they will uh, act together, yes? And in that sense, it's also important to recognize the series of cognates for RK that, that precede the notion of... The series of them? The series of cognates. Uh, RK, principle, principle, ground, fundament, all of these are the condition for uh, the uh, continuation and grounding of a philosophy, a first philosophy, but also its institutions and so on. So, arche ground principle. And I can't help but think of uh, Machiavelli's book, uh, Principe, the Prince, and also the Principle. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the whole semantic uh, sphere of uh, beginning, you will have the, the sphere of, uh, you can say, commanding. Eh? For instance, the, the term order, to give an order. Order comes from the Latin ordior, which means to begin. Okay. So the order has to do with the giving birth, begin, etc. So we, we have to uh, reflect uh, on this connection, this uh, strong and uh, in some way secret but also evident connection between an origin and a command. And uh, on the idea of the uh, archaeological historical machine, uh, which, uh, which really defines in some way our culture, uh, especially in uh, our Christian and Jewish Christian and Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, where <coughs> always a beginning, a radical beginning, more strong than in the Greek uh, classical world, when there is no beginning, clear beginning, there is but no clear, there you have a clear beginning and then a history which will begin from that uh, origin and go on uh, with a direction, with an history of salvation. And this is also true in philosophy, eh, as Thomas uh, observed. By the way, we, are, we will uh, reflect on this term, uh, origin, commandment, also we will see will, uh, etc. But we will, this uh, concept, usually in our culture, are considered as referring to the practical sphere, to the praxis, or to psychology, the will as a faculty of the soul, etc. On the contrary, we will try to uh, give back to this term their original ontological status. Eh? We will treat them as concept of what we call first philosophy or ontology. I mean, uh, why, why this philosophy is called first? It's called first because what is at stake there is the most decisive event for man. Eh? 
the uh, ontology has to do with the becoming human of man, with the anthropogenesis, and we will come back to this idea. So, so the first philosophy is not a, 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 a abstract uh, academic uh, discipline, is something which has to do with the becoming human of man. And this is an event which, uh, again, never ceases to happen. We are still on the process of becoming human. We never, we are not at all human, we are not, not at all achieving our becoming human. So it's a, it's a, a tension, it's a field of tension between a human and the human animal and, and the man, etc. <coughs> you can put it in whatever terms, but it is a, an event still in progress. And, and, and uh, philosophy, first philosophy, concerns this, this decisive question. <coughs> so, in philosophy, no, so this uh, problem, I, sh I showed how strong it is in theology especially in Christian theology, the link between uh, origin and commandment and the idea that uh, an origin never ceases to begin and command. But uh, I would just take an example in the philosophical tra modern tradition where this link is stated and reaffirmed with this particular emphasis. I, I refer to Heidegger conception of history of being. Heidegger's idea is that what he called Anfang, beginning. Anfang <coughs> never ceases to happen. It's what will perhaps hide itself in the history of being which it has produced, but it will continue to determine like a destiny this history. Heidegger, as if you are familiar with his, uh, uh, his work, uh, plays, makes a pun on the term, the German term for history, Geschichte, which comes from the verb schicken, to send, to mandate, to envoy. And you will see history as a series of Epochal Schickungen, epochal sending from this Anfang, this beginning. So there is a, <coughs> a beginning, and from this beginning, history just flows. It is sent. <coughs> Schicken. Eh? And Schickung means in German destiny. So history, the Schichte, is a destiny. Schickung. Why? Because it has been sent by this Yanfang, the beginning. So according to Heidegger, the history uh, of being, which is also the history of uh, man, eh, is governed by this principle, this beginning, which remains hidden in what uh, it uh, originates. And that's, this is why, uh, according to Heidegger, <coughs> the first thing we need to do is what he calls a destruction of the tradition. Eh? We receive a tradition, a cultural, historical, religious, uh, whatever tradition, but uh, in order to go back to this, the hidden origin, the hidden Anfang, which is uh, acting there, we have first to destroy this tradition and in order to have access to the origin. So you will see here also there is a, an archaeology which is demanded. In order to understand the history, you have to make an archaeological gesture, destroy the tradition you received, and through this destruction, try to have access to the origin. And by the way, this can also be true on uh, a personal uh, uh, 
level, eh? you could, uh, for instance, say, what is a psychoanalysis? A psychoanalysis is just a personal archaeology. You had uh, a certain moment, uh, a beginning trauma, which determined your destiny, be, uh, remaining hidden, you know, because the trauma then, uh, uh, according to Freud, there is a repression of the traumatic event, so you don't know anymore about, uh, about this uh, traumatic event. But then, this uh, traumatic event will manifest itself, for instance, through neurotic symptoms, etc., etc. And then you will be obliged to go to a psychoanalysis in order to make your archaeological regression to this uh, traumatic origin, etc., etc. So you see, you can see how strong is this idea that uh, the history, the life of uh, a culture, tradition, a being, uh, yeah. is determined by the origin, determined in the sense that it is still commanded by it. So origin is not something neutral, who then uh, gives birth and then uh, stops and disappears. No, it is a command. And perhaps you could say uh, that if the idea of history is so strong in our cultural tradition, uh, you know that in some way Western tradition is the more uh, strongly grounded on uh, history of all other culture, uh, it is probably for that. And that's, what, that's why I said uh, archaeological historical machine. Uh, because uh, you have an history only if you have a strong solidarity between origin and command. If you had a, a culture when there is an origin and no commandment, the concept of history will change completely. Perhaps you will not have the, the even it will not need the concept of history. Or if you have a commandment without an origin, also the, the problem of history will change. So we have our uh, archaeological historical machine because we have this strong connection between origin and command. Yes? Uh, what is the quality of the commandment? Is it a what is the quality? The quality is the radical, violent disruption? Does it have is it because the way you're talking about it now, some of the comparisons you're bringing, let's say, um, sounds more like it's a, it has a quality of a violence to it, not just the kind of it doesn't just happen, it has more of an eruption, more of a dramatic quality to the commandment. So I'm just curious if you're going to talk about the quality of it. I'm not sure that it is necessarily violent or, or strong. It can be of this, but it can also have a more secret and hidden form. So in the way that the origin will command without knowing, without, it, without uh, manifest itself. So. Then, if you try to make an archaeology investigation and build a discover, <coughs> so it can be, a, a, for instance, a trauma in a, a dramatic event. Yeah. Yes. But then, trauma, <coughs> by definition, is for, is a literate, is forgotten. So, so the violence, uh, there is no violence in some way. And, and uh, the same form we have, uh, like always, not commandment can have a the meaning of uh, something violent, something which uh, exerts a force, a domination on people. But we can have also other, more subtle form of a commandment which, uh, with which we are accustomed in our so-called democracies, <coughs> in which, on the contrary, there is a commandment, okay, but it takes uh, more subtle forms of uh, advice, suggestion, and like uh, it is for your security, you should cooperate with us, etc. Et so, so the com uh, advertisement is a kind of, uh, it's a commandment, but a very <coughs> hidden one, a sweet one. And uh, so uh, also commandment can have many, many instances. And for instance, no? 
and other things that governs our culture, just to see how the commandment is strong in our culture, technological devices contains a commandment in themselves. But this commandment is made in the form that you have to command them. So you have the commands to command the apparatus, but if you just think a moment, it is the apparatus who says what you can command. It's very clear, <laughs> it is in, in every level, even in more simple things, a, a car. You think that you drive the car, but you drive the car according to its mechanism, which will uh, require that you do this, you do that, you do this. So while commanding, you are obeying to the commandment of the machine. So it's very uh, computer also. Now, when you are using a computer, you will command it, but you will command it, the computer, according to the possibility of commanding, which are included in the commandment, which is in the machine. Is it that clear? So just to say that the commandment is not necessarily something violent, something uh, exerted in, in the form of violence, but can have, and today it tends to have more and more, this subtle form uh, for which uh, uh, Foucault and Deleuze use the form, the term government, governance. So, and they distinguish, as you know, from the old uh, sovereign power who exert domination uh, and will distinguish from this old uh, ancien regime power, the modern democratic or whatever power which governs. And governs much more it's a kind of management, eh? it manages the, eh? So this is an important point, but it's not... Uh, yes? Should we... Um, I was in Chris Spence's class. I was in Chris Spence's uh, Heidegger class last week, and we were reading uh, uh, this essay about the technology from Heidegger, where he talks about Geschick uh, and so on. And if, if it's useful for the group, we can share this essay uh, uh, for some, some background about this relationship mm -hmm. with the technology and history and so on. Yeah, in some way, uh, there are also other texts in which uh, we will see Heidegger speaks of the notion of commandment. This is on the Nietzsche books. Mm -hmm. There he will show because Nietzsche speaks about commandment and will. And but uh, what I just wanted to emphasize today is that uh, Heidegger's conception of the history of the being, Geschichte as being a, a series of epochal ascending from the origin, is grounded on this same solidarity between origin and commandment. Destiny, the idea of destiny. So I spoke about this uh, important Heidegger's conception of uh, the history of being <laughs> that we can, from uh, the point of view of our seminar, read as grounded on the solidarity of uh, origin and commandment. Heidegger did not say uh, the word commandment is not pronounced by Heidegger in this context, in other context. But we can see and try to read it like that. And I will now just um, uh, say something about two very interesting developments of uh, this Heideggerian conception of uh, history as uh, commanded by an origin. So as grounded on the <coughs> homonymy between uh, origin and uh, command. There are two, so just uh, mention two uh, developments. The one is a development theory that we could uh, define as a, an anarchical reading of Heidegger. It's an anarchical reading of Heidegger. I refer to Rainer Schurman, beautiful book called Le Principe d'Anarchie, The Principle of Anarchy. It's a book published in 1982. Also, 
Rainer Schumann uh, had a formation, uh, a theological formation in uh, Paris, by the way, in the same uh, institution, the Dominicans, where in the last uh, years of his life, Foucault used to work, the Bibliothèque du Soulchoir. It's a curious coincidence, because both will try to develop an archaeology. So what uh, does, what, uh, does Schurman do? How Schurman tries to cope <coughs> with this inner solidarity between origin and uh, commandment. Okay? He's perfectly aware of this solidarity, and his strategy will be to try to attempt to break this complicity. Okay? He will try to break the link between origin and commandments in the direction of origin. I mean, he will try to neutralize the commandment in order to reach what he will call a pure origin, which uh, he will define as a simple venue à la présence, à la présence coming to presence. So the origin just a pure coming to presence with no implication of commandment. So it's clear what he's trying to do is to break the complicity between the origin and commandment we saw, and he's trying to reach an origin with no commands, no, which commands nothing. That's why he said an anarchical uh, development. Uh, he, he speaks of anarchy, the principle of anarchy is the fact. So it's very interesting attempt, and we try to do if uh, it can work. Uh, he, he will uh, speak uh, of a deconstruction, deconstruction de l'origine, so like in Heidegger, yeah. but he will uh, take this term deconstruction. So we need, in order to break the link between origin and commandment, we need the deconstruction of the origin, and we go back, we, we at every point, we try to split origin and commandment to see how uh, this uh, link between the origin and commandment was produced, was originated. And then, so we will try to reach an arche eh, which will make no, which will command nothing. And also, which will, at the origin of nothing, pure coming to the presence. With no history, with nothing. So it's also a kind of, kind of a apocalyptical idea of an end of history. But keeping the origin, very strange attempt. So, what uh, uh, I, I said that it has a theological formation, so typical theological formation. He will uh, keep at any price the origin, the idea of an origin. But then he will try to separate, to split it from uh, all this connection of historical. Uh, Lead to a commandment, uh, an history of being, etc. Et That's why it's, it's an anarchy. So you have an anarchical arche. You will have an arche which commands nothing. Yes? It makes it's an interesting phrase to command nothing because it seems this is the problem we have now. Because uh, it sounds like a command to nihilism. There will be nothing. There can be nothing. Absolutely. But what we try to show now is. Show how why these two devils we are going to speak about uh, are not, uh, according to my opinion, uh, adequate because they will keep in a way this idea of uh, an origin or a commandment, even if it is in the form of commanding of nothing, originating of nothing. So, with, uh, so, he, uh, so he speaks of an archaeology. Uh, and he will uh, also, uh, without naming it, he makes uh, a criticism of Foucault's idea of uh, <coughs> archaeology, because he will write that, that uh, if you try to rearticulate the idea of arche as he, he believes that Foucault does, it's not true, anymore. in the form of epistemology, you, then you still uh, you still remain taken in this uh, idea of an history of being. Uh, will say, on the contrary, he will say uh, what he calls the deconstructed arche, 
is an original in which uh, the knowable is grasped at the very point of its epochal ordering where still no science is produced. So it tries to reach an origin which is no knowledge, no commanding, no history is still there. It's yet there. Mm -hmm. So we will oppose uh, the arcade, the sense of principle, which governs <coughs> and discloses its effects, to the idea of an original, where on the contrary, nothing is disclosed. It is the pure manifestation, the pure event of disclosing as such, coming to be as such, with no, with no continuation, nothing in which it comes out. So he writes, the deconstruction is a methodology which frees the pure event of the manifestation, the finest angle, the pure appearance, kind of pure coming to presence, frees this coming to presence from the historical configuration of the past. So it's kind to extract the origin from its history. No? We saw that there is a strong link between origin and commandment and history. Schurman is trying to break this connection and it, uh, in order to reach a pure origin with no history. So the, in this way, uh, the construction uh, will achieve its task when revealing, he writes, the historical assemblage of epochal, epochal representation, it, it disentangles and frees the coming to presence, which founds nothing, and, this, and thus brings to the end the history. So you see, his strategy, as I said, is to neutralize the commandment and reach an origin, a pure origin as such, with no history, with no, which commands nothing. So this is what we call the anarchical development of Heidegger, because it is a reading of Heidegger, it, it is a reading of the idea of Heidegger, conception of history, in this anarchical direction. Then there is a, another attempt that we could call the democratic attempt to cope with this problem. This is, I think, Jacques Derrida. So I will oppose Jacques Derrida gesture to the anarchical gesture by Schulman. Uh, what is uh, Derrida's strategy? Uh, it's, uh, uh, similar and in a way opposed to the one of Schurman. While Schurman tried to neutralize the <coughs> commandment and keep in the pure form, in its pure form, the origin, then that does the contrary. He will neutralize the origin, which as you know will be reduced to the status of a trace. There is no origin. There is a pure deferment. The origin is always in the place of a trace. So the origin is neutralized, but I believe that still a kind of commandment is kept. And this commandment could take the form of what uh, could even formulate it very simply the form, the imperative interpret, deconstruct. There is no origin, but still something is there that we have to deconstruct, to interpret. So in both cases, the archaeological historical machine is uh, transformed, is uh, transgressed <coughs> in some way, but in my opinion, in that way, the archaeological historical machine is not stopped, it's not really broken it still functions in a peculiar way. In the, in the Schurman perspective, you, are, you will have a pure origin which commands nothing. In the other way, you will not have no more an origin, but still an injunction, a pure injunction, with no content. Because when I say interpreter, is an injunction with no content. Nothing is commanded, just uh, to still be in that deferment to remain in his deferment. Yes? In the very first chapter of Schumann's Pensi mm -hmm. he offers 
a definition of deconstruction. And he says, if I remember correctly, deconstruction interrupts, throws out of here the derivations between Jackson? interrupts or intervenes in uh, throws out of here the derivations between uh, first philosophy and practical philosophy. And this, in this sense, there's an agreement, uh, although only for a moment, but an agreement between Schumann and, and Derrida, because Schumann, uh, to, to overturn the, 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 the derivations, and these are institutions, protocols, languages, prohibitions, uh, is the very meaning of deconstruction. But for Schumann, it leaves a pure and empty uh, origin without command for, for Derrida. No such possibility of purity uh, can be so occur. Anyway, exactly as you said, this uh, uh, continuity of revelation mm -hmm. is still there in, in, one, in one perspective, only an origin, and the other way, no more an origin, but still uh, this. That's why I say they are opposed but symmetrical. So the anarchical and the democratic uh, uh, attempt to cope with uh, the problem are in a way opposed but symmetric. Is that clear? Is that, uh, yes, so it's interesting because both perceive clearly what we uh, stated, the meaning the solidarity between origin and command. Each one in a peculiar, in its peculiar way, but both try to cope with this uh, phenomenon, which we call the archaeological historical machine. So both try to cope with this, but they try uh, playing one pole against the other, and this is never enough. It's never satisfactory. My way. I think that uh, as uh, our culture is always grounded on dichotomies. And if you will see, that's why I speak of a machine that is always a bipolar machine, always a dichotomic machine, which always has two elements, which are distinguished and linked. And this makes the machine work, precisely. So, uh, and when you have to face such a machine, it can, be, it can be useful uh, tactically to play a pole against the other eh, in order to, to in your fight against uh, the enemy you can do this but at the end if you just play a pole against the other that will be not enough it's not satisfactory and if you reflect usually this is the way that the critics of our culture all the critics of our culture perceives the double machine, but always thinks, no, there is a pole which is bad, and now I will uh, focus on the other pole, which is good, and I will play the one against the other. If you think uh, almost every attempt to cope with uh, the, the, the founding problem of our culture will have this form. But this form is it, a, a good start, perhaps, but you cannot stop at the playing one pole against the other. <coughs> it's not enough. You will have my idea is that you, in order to really uh, disactivate and neutralize the machine, you will have to make inoperative and disactivate both poles of the machine. That's the only way to stop the machine. And to free a third, another possibility. But if you stay against the other, in my opinion, this is not enough. What do you think? Can I have just one comment, one thing that always helps me to see uh, symmetry, uh, mm -hmm. to understand symmetry beyond the idea of equalness, so that so to exactly see symmetry as something that can have opposites, is the way in which symmetry works in physics. So it works the in way in, it works in physics, mm -hmm. the way in which Symmetry in physics is used to understand the level of operation that happened in the middle, where two things are compared, and so it's a comparison in time, and supposedly of the same things, it's two frames of the same thing, and the character of their comparison allows you to understand what happened in the middle. And of course, all the, all the times that, that is not easy to see, there is a, um, 
one has understood that something more significant has happened to make it simple. Yeah, I think so. This is why also I uh, always um, uh, use the idea, the comparison with uh, an electric or magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Because in the uh, philosophical tradition of Western culture, on the contrary, we have dichotomies, meaning two elements opposed, simply opposed, and such as that you can clearly uh, trace a line which will uh, separate them. While, for instance, if you take an electric or an electromagnetic field, uh, both poles will be present in each point in a different uh, symmetry. And then you can have uh, then a, a neutral zone in which both will be equal and so will neutralize each other. But I mean, it's more interesting to have this idea of an electric uh, field, of a field, of a scientific uh, physical field, than the idea of a, a substantial opposition of two substances. There are no substances in a way to be opposed. They are just forces, tensions, historical tensions, historical, like in an electromagnetic field. And this um, it's a very important methodological point. When you will have to cope with a problem, and you will have two concepts, for instance, two elements, whatever, try not to substantialize them. Try not to conceive them as uh, clearly distinguishable and uh, definable uh, position of positions, but try to transform the dichotomical position in a dipolar position in the sense of the electric field, in the sense of the field, the tensions. So both tensions will be there in every point, and you will never be able to cut a line to cut both and separate clearly them. I think this is a good beginning in order to better work and uh, cope with the problem in opposition. Is that clear, this methodological point? And the, the difference between a, a dichotomy and a depolarity, a substantial position and a field of tensions where you have an opposition, but much more subtle, much more different articulated. Is this point clear? <laughs> yes. So let, let's just me uh, still comment something of, of uh, the <laughs> the attempt by Derrida and Schurman, and because I think they defined uh, a very important point which defines our condition today, the condition in which our cultural tradition <coughs> is today. So what uh, Derrida and Schurman did uh, is to keep something, the origin of the commandment, in this form in which they commence nothing or originate, originate nothing. So we could call this form a zero degree form of presence. And I will imply this uh, term, I will uh, focus now on this uh, expression zero degree, because it defines the situation of our culture today. Like you said uh, a moment before, what is this idea of zero degree? <coughs> the philosophical premise of this concept is in Aristotle metaphysics, in a very important but a short passage, Metaphysics uh, 1004, A16, if you want to go there. In that uh, short passage, Aristotle distinguished between privation and absence. Privation, the Greek term is stasis, privation, something is lacking, missing, and simple absence, apousia. It's not simply, there is not. In the privation, Aristotle states, being still manifests itself in the form of stasis, of privation, of lacking, of missing. So steresis, the privation, is a form of presence. Zero form of presence, you could say today. While apousia, simply something is not there, but it's not lacking. 
it's not like it simply is, it's not there so there is idea that uh, you can have a pri private privative opposition privation is not the same as uh, simple absence of course why you lack it why you feel the lacking of something because in some way in this uh, missing this uh, lacking uh, still something is present in the form of its uh, deprivation and it will, Aristotle will even say steresis is an ethos privation is a form yeah. <coughs> sorry for my voice but um, it seems to me at this point about deprivation is fundamental to Sartre's letter to Sartre where he says that absence not no using but, but a deprivation a lack that's a little bit that will come to is a powerful presence yeah, you will trace. find this notion uh, the idea I was trying to suggest that this uh, idea that Aristotle very briefly formulated uh, the idea that uh, uh, privation and absence are different <coughs> and that in privation being is still there the being which is lacking is still manifests itself this idea governs you can find it in every aspect of our culture you mentioned uh, Lacan and Sartre, we will now mention that. I think it's a fundamental trait <coughs> of uh, modern culture. So in the, 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 in the, con in the form of this, uh, as I articulated, it, zero degree, it was, uh, as you probably know, it's uh, strongly uh, present in linguistics. Eh? First, in Trubescoi, the famous book, uh, principle of phonology eh? he is the first to have this idea that if you have a morphological marked term and then you have a term which lacks this uh, for instance let's say there is a, uh, a particle which is added to a term then you have a, a term without this uh, mark he will say <coughs> the unmarked term is a zero degree mark and this is very fecund in uh, uh, his theory of the phonetics because then it can, it will oppose a zero phoneme to a marked phoneme so he can, wh why it's important he can keep an opposition where there is no more opposition so in this way why it is so useful in uh, linguistics because in, in this way you can establish an opposition where no more op there is, you have no more an opposition in this form, that when the mark is uh, lacking, this is a zero degree of the presence of the mark. And then Jacobson developed a lot of this, and he spoke clearly of a zero degree. Roland Barthes also then spoke of a zero degree of writing, etc. Et <coughs> so it's strongly present in the human science of the 20th century. And I could even say that the this, this, the force of uh, Saussurian linguistics in our <coughs> culture couldn't uh, uh, be without this uh, idea of a zero degree. Eh? Because through this idea that the absence of the mark is a zero degree of the mark, th that's, uh, th this governs all the system of Saussurian linguistics. But then you and uh, for instance in Levi Strauss again he theorized very clear this for an, anthrop for an anthropological usage then he will say that uh, <coughs> he will define something that he will call a zero signifier Signif signifier zero zero signifier which means that you have a signifier with no signification it's a that's a, perhaps uh, Levi Strauss is the one who much clearly articulates uh, uh, this idea. No? You can have uh, a signifier at zero degree to which no signification corresponds. So, so you have still a sign in the zero degree form. And this uh, he uses a lot in his anthropology, for instance, uh, we say notion like mana, uh, that uh, anthropology of uh, century used a lot to cope with uh, the primitive culture. They are just uh, empty signifiers who just mean the exigency of a complementary, supplementary meaning which is not there. 
he will even generalize this and say this is a kind of a, uh, anthropological condition of man uh, when uh, signification happened to man then there was a, a constitutive excess of signifier or signified so man according to Lewis Ross dispose and always continue to dispose of more signifier than possible signified so the, the work of culture is just always to try to connect uh, a meaning a signification to a signifier but you will have always an exceeding signifier which is a zero signifier so a signifier which has no, no signification no signifier does it then signify signification though, the, in the, the whole process, sort of in its emptiness? That signifier means this is zero signifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good. Well, we can say, what is the sense of this uh, zero signifier which has no signified? And it's a signifier which just means that there is signification. There is always a signification even when it is empty. And this is, this is one, uh, this is one uh, element that Jacques Derrida strongly will retake in opinion. Uh, Jacques Derrida's uh, idea of deconstruction uh, and uh, grammatology is grounded on, uh, the idea, on the idea that there is signification even when there is no sig signified. So th this idea of uh, a zero degree signification. <coughs> but you can, this, uh, really, you can try to uh, find and uh, investigate this presence of a zero element in every discipline, in every aspect of our culture. You say <coughs> the cancer analysis, but for instance, uh, uh, also, uh, there is a very beautiful debate which takes place uh, uh, in uh, 1934 between Walter Benjamin and Gershon Scholem, his uh, friend, specialist of uh, Kabbalah. Uh, they were both reading Kafka novels. Uh, so there is a very beautiful exchange of letters, especially on Kafka's novels, The Process, The Trial. How do you say process or trial? The Trial. The Trial. So, uh, Scholem reading of this uh, Kafka's novel is that in this uh, novel law, uh, but law he, you have to hear Torah, so meaning law and also tradition, commandment in, according to Scholem in Kafka's novels law, Torah, is present in the form of what he calls a nothing of revelation nix de Offenbach so there is an offenbar, there is a revelation, but in the form of nothing. And we also say, I mean that law, Torah, is still there in the sense that it, it is in force, but means nothing. Give it, he says, but it means. So there is a, a very strange situation of a, Geltung ohne Betäubung. The law is in force, but does order and command nothing. And that's the situation in Kafka's novels. So the, the, the protagonists of Kafka novels are under a law which is the in force, but which orders nothing, which commands nothing. And this is all the sense of the trial, the, the castle, etc. And, so and so, according. Uh, to, to Sholem here we will say this signification is reduced to its null punct, point zero so you again employ the term zero mm -hmm. so I believe that this formula being in force without signification expresses the state of, of tradition and law in which we live state uh, clearly this. Eh? Our tradition to, uh, today 
we live in a under a tradition, a prescription, a law, etc., etc., which is there, it is in force, valid, but prescribes nothing. Yes? I just wanted to talk about the thing now in a different domain of economics, where you have two phrases, a command economy and a fiat currency. In both, yeah. A fiat currency. In both cases, in a command economy, you create goods out of nothing for consumers that don't exist. And in the second, you create money out of nothing by saying that uh, we need X amount of dollars to make the economy run. It's something that we have problems in America. But my question is for you is, where, from where does this power come for the um, hegemon of the, of the command and the fiat, which are words that we only use when we're talking about power that is above us? Right. Where's, so where's, where's that power come to create the signifier? Yeah, very, very interesting point. Yeah. So first, it's very interesting that both of the economy we can find the kind of dimension in which there is uh, something we should agree on. It's precisely so. The interest of our uh, investigation on command is also trying to understand to understand what is the force of command. So with the idea that the usual answer. So is the power is a transcendent uh, force that is no more valid. So we, we are trying to understand why commandment is in force without referring to a some principle of the So trying to understand really how a commandment works. So. And that, I mean, that's what I'm wondering. And that's why we are saying that the tradition, when I say uh, our tradition is under this uh, paradigm of uh, what uh, Schrodinger calls a uh, uh, law which uh, prescribes nothing, which means nothing. So it's, uh, so it's interesting to understand how this thing can, uh, and of course in order, we are now trying to understand this, in order to, um, to disactivate this machine, this mechanism, of course. And also another, another important point, so really you find this in every domain. So if we now leave the, the idea of law in a religious sense, like in Shalom, and we take uh, the domain of law in juridical sense, here we have still the same thing. Eh? We have this uh, interesting idea, which was uh, first clearly developed by the German jurist Karl Schmidt, that the foundation of law is not the norm, but the exception. And so the real core of law is the state of exception. Meaning, by this, a state of the law in which law is suspended, in a way it does not apply, but it's still there still in force. And so it, it applies in withdrawing. And this is a, a very good definition of a state of exception. Now the state of exception is, a, I don't know if you are familiar, do you know what a state of exception is in law, sorry, legal term? So, uh, 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 the prison, some articles of the Constitution are suspended, like what Hitler did in '33 when he took the power. So. Uh, Law, uh, some articles concerning the free freedoms, etc., are suspended. This does not mean that the Constitution is abolished. In fact, there is no more law. According to this uh, juridical interpretation of the state of exception, law is still there in the form of its suspension, it is of its abeyance. So it uh, uh, does not apply, but in some way it applies in withdrawing from law. Retreating from it. And this is a, another way of thinking. Uh, today, this is a, a very strong paradigm eh, in uh, some international law, etc. No? We are under this paradigm. We are in a perpetual state of exception, which authorizes everything, but, but still wants to present itself as being legal. So, uh, so the state of exception is used today 
each five minutes, everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. But they will say, ah, yeah, but it's still legal. While what, for instance, Benevis does with respect to Schmidt, no, if uh, a law is uh, suspended, there is no more law, there is an, not norms. So, the, you see how, so this, uh, this pretension, again, we could formulate this idea of state of exception, there is a zero degree of law. Law is uh, not uh, applied, but it is uh, present in the form of a zero degree, which it prescribes nothing, just withdraws. But you see, so this could be, also this must be <coughs> a revoked in question. You know? This idea that uh, there is a state of, uh, a degree, uh, a zero degree of law. Yeah, of course, we, we must criticize this idea. What Benjamin does with respect to Schmidt is precisely this. And also in the discussion with Sean, he will say, the uh, Torah in Kafka novels, you are wrong, it's not uh, a law in a null, in a zero degree of presence, it is no more a law, simply life. That's the an answer to show that. You see, in, in, you must read Kafka's novels, not in the idea that Kafka is keeping the law in the form of the, the zero degree. It's not true. By the way, this was the, the idea of uh, Max Broad and other very stupid uh, friends of Kafka. So. But um, this idea is much more interesting. If uh, law is in this condition in which it uh, prescribes nothing and means nothing, then there is no more law, no more Torah, no more scripture. You just have life. So what you have in the castle in the process is a, a life, and then you have to try to understand this life, not pretending that it is a zero degree of the Torah. Of the so a, a law which is uh, in its uh, zero degree form or in the form of state of exception is no more a law, it's anon, absence. So this is the, the answer eh, to the pretension that law is uh, present in the form of uh, its uh, abeyance, suspension. This is point clear and it's an important point. I was just going to add to uh, what we were talking about with the economy. You know, each of the nation states have these uh, independent uh, Bank of the U.S., Bank of Canada, you know, whatever Europe, that set their currency levels and release certain amounts of money, and, and usually it's set up as an independent aspect of these places. And so, under democratic regimes, there's just some sense that we have some say over it, or some level of interest that it's this kind of objective independence, uh, expert driven um, aspect. And it requires, I guess, a certain level of public simplicity to allow it to happen. There's a linkage with a state of exception. Uh, like where I'm from, we just had the 2010 Olympics. And mm -hmm. the 2010 Olympics, the Winter Olympics. And in the lead up to that, all of these uh, laws, temporary things that are put into place to protect corporate sponsors, freedom of speech, things that are put into the practice that, you know, don't violate the Constitution per se, but they're brought in specially for three months or six months, and then the day the surface leaves come, everything goes back to normal. But once again, it's almost like this requirement of a level of public support to allow that to happen. Yeah, and for instance, um, from a historical point of view, it's important to understand what happened in uh, Germany during the Nazi regime. Is that Hitler, as soon as he was named the Chancellor, suspended the articles of the Constitution in so it was in a state of exception. But while usually a state of exception lasts uh, one month, uh, three months, uh, six months, uh, it was never revoked. <coughs> so the Nazi regime is in a state of exception which lasted 12 years. This is part of understand how then in Germany could happen such things as what happened. If you don't understand this, you would say, but how was it possible? There are most, no, there are not most, uh, just the, the, the state of law in that point permitted this because it was a, a state of seven which lasted 12 years. You want to ask something? Yes. Uh, 
understand this. It's 20 years that we have a crisis every day. And it's the same thing. It's a state exception which lasts, which became a normal way of governing. So the zero degree becomes the norm. I think that uh, Schurman and Derrida attempt to cope with the, what we call the archaeological Sardar machine is not adequate because still keeps adhere to this paradigm of zero degree. <coughs> the machine does not produce any more meaning eh, but still functions. The origin originates nothing, the commandment commands nothing. But it's kept in the pure form of a zero degree. So, injun pure injunction which uh, orders nothing, uh, pure origin coming to presence which uh, gives birth to nothing. And perhaps the philosopher who <coughs> most clearly uh, stated this idea, uh, it is Jean Luc Nancy in a book called. 1983 book called uh, The Categorical <coughs> Imperative. Uh, the title is uh, very clear. So, the idea of uh, an imperative category, a categorical imperative. Uh, he develops this idea that the law today has the form of a pure imperative, a pure injunction, a pure destination without content nor end, nor goal. And then C calls the state which result, the status which result, the condition which results from this <coughs> pure categorical imperative, he calls this abandonment, être abandonné. So the law uh, abandons, does not apply and order something, but just abandons the, the people to which it is destined. So he, you know, and he, he plays with the abandon and ban. So we will say uh, the law <coughs> delivers to a ban. So it's a form of banishment, being banned. Also then, the pure form of an abandonment. So it's uh, just to, again, it's just uh, another more strong formulation of this idea that the stage of the archaeological historical machine in which we live has this form of a pure commandment which commands nothing. So on the contrary, what we are trying, we try to do here in our archaeology of the commandment, so it's a different form of archaeology. And archaeology 
which is meant not to keep an arche in this form, the zero degree arche, commandment or origin. <coughs> So we will uh, we will try. It's not easy. We will try to uh, uh, make a different archaeology, and probably starting from Foucault's idea of archaeology, which is in some way, <coughs> from that point of view, more interesting than uh, Schulman and Derrida model. What, what is the main idea of uh, uh, Foucault archaeology? two books which are interesting for that point. The first one is the not book, a lecture, uh, an essay on the concept of origin in Nietzsche. It's published in 1971. Nietzsche, la genealogie, and so on. So <coughs> there he makes a strong critique of the idea of uh, origin, Ursprung, following Nietzsche. So he criticized the idea that there is an origin in which you can really grasp the thing as it really was and as it really will continue to be. So he tries to criticize this idea of an origin. And the second uh, example is the, his book, L'Archéologie du Savoir, in which he formulates, uh, I, I just take two expressions by him this uh, interesting idea of what he will call uh, in, uh, historical a priori. A priori historic. Uh, historical a priori. It is a contradiction uh, because uh, uh, normally something which is a priori, which is something transcendental in Kant term, is not something historic, it's something meta-historical. But then he formulates these uh, contradictory concepts. No, we can have uh, something which is a priori, but it's still it is in the history. So it's very provocative and uh, uh, contradictory concept, but very interesting because it has the idea that you can have in history something which is a kind of uh, a priori, but it is still in the historical development. <coughs> Uh, so perhaps he took this idea from Marcel Mauss, who also for uses this idea for certain uh, concepts uh, that the archaeological archaeologists, uh, anthropology use. So it's, uh, I will just, um, I will not follow so the interpretation of this, just this idea that you can work with a concept which is both historical and uh, a priori. And he tries to place this idea against the idea of an arche as a strong origin which uh, will determine and present the thing as it really was. How can we understand this idea? So, uh, in Foucault it's not clear. I admit that in Foucault it's not clear. I will try now to give you some examples uh, of the way in which we can try to understand this concept and attempt to reach an idea, an idea of arche, an archaeology which is different from the one we saw. The first example I will give you comes from linguistics, from the domain of compared grammar, Indo-European linguistics. I don't know if you are familiar with uh, this uh, beautiful chapter of the history of linguistics when, uh, through the discovery, uh, when the Sanskrit uh, came to scholars in Europe in the end of the 19th, then 19th century, then the scholars begin to realize that there are many languages to which they were familiar uh, Greek, Latin, French, German. English, Russian, etc., etc., Sanskrit, they were clearly uh, similar. They, they had a similar structure. It was a great discovery. 
the term the history of linguistics. <coughs> so they then uh, developed this idea of the Indo-European languages, meaning a family of languages which seems to have a common arche, <coughs> which we don't know. Of course, we do not know the Indo-European. But uh, what is precisely interesting, you could, uh, and someone did in this way, understand this idea of an arche as in, in, this, in the way that we suppose that uh, 10,000 uh, century years ago, there was a people, the Indo-European, who spoke a, lost, a language now lost, the Indo-European, which then gave origin to all this language we know, and we still speak. Then in this way you substantialize the, this idea of the Indo-European, and so that you suppose that uh, a certain moment of the history of mankind, the people existed who spoke a certain language. But this is not the way in which the, the good linguists <coughs> uh, understand this, the idea of the European. For instance, we take the, the, the example of the great French linguist, Antoine Meillet. He clearly states what we call the Indo-European is just an algorithm conceived in order to express a correspondence between a certain number of existing languages. So we have a number of existing languages and we do not need to presuppose a real, another real existent and lost language. What we call the Indo-European is just a way to express <coughs> a, a system of correspondence between these languages. So when the Indo-European linguists, because they go very far, eh, they, in the etymology, they come to roots, and even some, sometimes they hypothesize what uh, an Indo-European word should, uh, could be. For instance, the term, they, they write this with an asterisk as well before, for instance, uh, Davos, the term for God, which then gave in all other language, <coughs> languages uh, the term, uh, the many terms for God. So, how, so how, how is this, how have we to understand this word? Is it an arche in the sense uh, of uh, an existing thing that uh, really took place in a certain moment of the chronology? So, very far, of course. Uh, many, many, many centuries ago, this word was really spoken. No, but he suggests a different way. No, this we have to understand as an arche, but historical, because it, it just functions to make us better understand the existing historical language. Through this uh, establishment of this uh, European pattern, we can better understand the grammar, the similarities, the function of the existing languages. And in, in this way, they really transformed the interpretation and the scientific uh, knowledge of uh, the existing European language, Greek, Latin, English, German, Russian, etc. So you see, it's a very different way to understand an idea. Either you understand it as something uh, who really <coughs> happened in the chronology, as a fact which happened in the chronology, or not at all, you understand, as an historical a priori, which uh, is not a fact in a way, but allows you to open a new field of knowledge, allows you to better understand historical facts, meaning the historical languages. Is it clear? So it's important to understand that you can have an arche which is historical. But it is an a priori because uh, the term Davos is not a fact. So it really, so we can understand what uh, Foucault could uh, mean when he spoke of an historical a priori. It could be something like that. Something which just <coughs> allows us to better understand historical 
So it's a, it's a regression <coughs> to a past, but not to a chronological past. This is very important. So our archaeology will regress to a past, which can also have the form of some historical fact that, that we are analyzing. But in the end, the archive we are looking for is not an, uh, an historical fact which could be situated in a certain chronology and in a certain place. So that's a very different model of archive. Is that clear? <coughs> so this is in some ways like uh, Max Weber talks about the, the ideal type in society. And it's something that describes uh, not necessarily a specific individual, but instead understanding this ideal type allows us to understand this set of relations that makes possible what we are dealing with now. Uh, similar, perhaps in Endeavor is more, uh, it's, it's types who allow a better description, while the in European term really uh, opens a new way to to look at, at the, sim uh, the, the similarity of languages. Uh, so, but it says it's similar. So, uh, an historical a priori could be something like that. 